There we go. So you might get a little pop up that we are now being recorded. So welcome to those of you who are joining us on YouTube as well. For the webinar, everyone is muted. Your cameras are off um, and because this is a webinar format. So uh, if you miss anything or if you want to share this with friends later, it's going to be uploaded to our YouTube channel. I usually get them up within a day. So you can also see our YouTube channel for all the past webinars that we've done. We've got a whole library of great information you might be interested in. So check us out, give us a follow. Um, and if you have any questions, definitely don't hesitate to send me an email. If you have a question during the webinar, go ahead and use that Q&A box. Uh, with a lot of people watching, it can um, sometimes get clogged up in the chat. So go ahead and use that Q&A box and we will answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. For your safety, you should only be able to see what I post in the chat, but just in case we missed a setting or something, um, please don't click any links other than what I may post there. Um, on the TCF side of things, these webinars are offered to the public for free, but we encourage you to consider a donation or a membership. At the end of this webinar, you're going to be taken to a page that has all kinds of great resources, um, all of our TCF brochures, lots of information you might want about native plants, things like that. But as there's also our virtual tip jar. So if you're enjoying these webinars, we do encourage you to give us a donation that will help to keep us running. Um, also, thank you to those of you who donated during our um, new donation challenge at the end of last year. We were able to meet the $100,000 challenge, which then earned TCF another $100,000 from the Hamill Family Foundation. So that's really huge for us this year and really helps to keep us going. So thank you to all of all of you who donated. As I mentioned, we're doing these every week. And, and as long as you're watching, I'm going to keep doing them. So next week, we have Amanda Arnold of Planet Landscaping joining us to talk about what is your landscaping style. Um, I don't have much of a style on mine. I, I jokingly refer to mine as cage match gardening. I throw everybody in together and whoever survives gets to stay. I don't think that's a great landscaping style, though. So I'm looking forward to learning more from Amanda. And so join us next week. And because winter is really a great time to start planning your gardens for the spring. So now that Christmas is over, we can start thinking spring and uh, get your get your gardens all planned out. And then on January 20th, the following week, we're going to be talking critters in the stream with the Forest Preserve District of DuPage County. So looking forward to learning lots of great stuff here in the new year. Hopefully learning more is one of your New Year's resolutions. I know it is for me. So all right. With that, I am going to turn it over to Connie. Connie is one of our educators at TCF, and we are so happy to have her because she knows a lot of cool stuff. So you may recognize Connie if you um, have been following our webinars. She did one on edible plants with us earlier or in, in uh, last year, and now she's back with us to talk about mushrooms. So Connie, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Jamie. I am excited. So I didn't know Amanda was presenting next week. I have worked with her. So and yeah, I, I like her a lot. And she's very knowledgeable. So I'm excited. I'll have to tune in to watch that one too. Um, yeah, I've watched a bunch of them. I really enjoy these. So it's fun to be here and get to be on the other side of it and presenting. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Oh, there we go. Get all ready here. Okay, so as Jamie said, I'm Connie. I am an environmental educator with the Conservation Foundation. And today we'll be talking a little bit about mushrooms. I presented before on some edible native plants and um, some organic gardening tips. And so I love to be outdoors and I have grown my own mushrooms, which is part of my experience and learning. It's been a little bit of hands-on learning. I started with a little kit, you know, years ago that I got for Christmas that was fun, a um, little countertop kit that was fun, and then have moved on from there. So we'll talk about that a little bit more coming up here soon um, in the presentation. But just to give you an idea of my mushroom knowledge and where that's all um, kind of begun, a lot of it was just that I find them fascinating. So being out and hiking or out in the yard, you'll see these things pop up sometimes in your yard. And, and I just always kind of wondered, you know, what is that? And 
Um, so I would take a picture and maybe start to learn how to identify some of these things and kind of learning one at a time over the years. I've, I've got quite a few now that I am pretty good with, and there are a whole bunch more that I don't know. Um, so I still have, even in a lot of the photos in my presentation today, a lot of them I know what they are, and some of them I don't. They're in my to be ID'd um, pile of photos. So, but they're still worth sharing. They're very cool to look at, and um, a lot of them, though, I will be telling you about. So this one, I want to point out. So this is really cool. These these pictures here, the one um, with all of these mushrooms on this log, and the one in the center, were both taken at my family's property, and. Um, I love the one on the left because it's just covered. Now there are a couple things I don't love because I see some invasive honeysuckle up here and things that need to go, but I really like uh, that log was just so cool. It was just covered. And the center one, can't really tell for scale, but these were so tiny. Um, these, the tops of these were smaller than a dime and just sitting so prettily on this, um, this branch over the creek. And I like this too, what we're going to talk a little bit about. If you see this kind of fuzzy looking um, area at the bottom of that one. We'll we'll talk a little bit about that and what that is. And then these, I actually saw, I think I took this picture across the street from the Conservation Foundation's property at McDonald Farm in Naperville, Illinois. Um, I think those were taken at Knocknalls Park across the street. That was last summer. And I'm, I'm, it was, I don't think I took that at the farm. I think it was across the street at Knocknalls, but they're just beautiful. This bright orange color growing from the base of this stump of a tree and in a shady area where, where you don't really see a lot of color or a lot of things blooming or a lot of brightness. It's this bright sunshiny yellow orange color was just gorgeous and eye-catching. So that's kind of what originally got me interested in mushrooms and um, I do like to eat them though too. So that's another part of it. I always, you know, if I can um, find something, forage something, grow something, that then I can eat and enjoy. That's uh, that just adds to the fun. So um, very quickly, as I mentioned, being an environmental educator for the Conservation Foundation, just quick, um, uh, and especially if you are already familiar, have been to um, have been watching any of the other web webinars. You may know this already, but I just want to give a quick intro for anyone who might not be familiar. We are a nonprofit. Since 1972, we are also very proud to be accredited by the Land Trust Alliance, and our mission is to improve the health of our communities by preserving and restoring natural areas and open space, protecting rivers and watersheds, and promoting stewardship of our environment, and mushrooms certainly help to do some of those things. So what we'll be talking about today um, this is going to be kind of a, an overview of a lot of the questions we get. So especially if you're one who knows a lot about mushrooms already, some of these things um, you know, might not be new knowledge to you, but hopefully there'll be a couple of interesting things that you'll still pick up. But we have a lot of people who ask, um, you know, kind of some, some of the same questions come up frequently. So I really wanna cover those and kind of do an overview. So one of the first things is, like I mentioned, what got me interested, sometimes you just walk out into your yard and you'll see mushrooms there that weren't there before. A lot of times it's right after a good rain um, and they just pop up and um, maybe they're in your wood chips, in your mulch or on a tree stump, um, sometimes even in your lawn, in your grass. And you may have even seen, um, this is one we, we get a lot of questions about too, if you ever see mushrooms growing in a ring, in a circle on the lawn, and sometimes even before the mushrooms appear, there will be a dark green ring where the grass is darker, greener than, than the other areas of the lawn. Um, and some people call that a fairy ring because it looks like you know the fairies were, were there dancing overnight. You come out in the morning and there's this ring of mushrooms where the fairies were dancing. Um, and so when we see these things and either they're just really interesting looking or you know it kind of gets us curious about it and so um people start asking questions and wanting to know what this stuff is and one of the first things that um that people often worry about is is this okay like are these okay to be here they weren't here yesterday they just popped up out of nowhere is this a problem and i, I can kind of understand um why people wonder that sometimes. So one of the first questions is, okay, I've got these things that popped up in my yard. Do I want them there? Some of them 
in this picture on the left, these little things, these protrusions that are coming up, this is a mushroom called, <laughs> these are dead man's fingers. Isn't that an awful sounding name? That doesn't sound like something we would want in our, in our yards. These over here, this is a stink horn. That's again, <laughs> something, these don't sound so great. So sometimes people aren't really sure, is this a good thing? Is this really something I want to have here? Um, and then also, oops, didn't mean to do that, sorry. So the other thing too that people wonder about is that little fuzzy stuff that I pointed out in the one picture, the kind of fuzzy looking thing at the, um, at the base of the stem of that mushroom that people see and think it's mold. And um, they'll also think, well, a mushroom is a fungus. And um, if they see what's called mycelium, if they see those white thread-like um, parts spreading out across wood mulch or um, you know, near their plants or at the base of a mushroom, they associate that with mold. A lot of people think that's mold and they, they worry that it could be a problem. We have a negative association with mold. A lot of times people think of black mold or it's dangerous for our health. Um, and so they worry. And then also if, if there are gardeners, anyone who has ever had to deal with um, any type of fungal disease um, in their plants, maybe affecting their tomatoes or like a powdery mildew, uh, people who grow squash, or even a lot of times we see it on Monarda and a lot of our natives and our flowers, um, especially in our area of, in Northern Illinois if, and with dampness, depending on the weather, um, that can really be conducive to those types of things growing and spreading. So people worry and they think that um, this is not something we want to have growing in our yards. So. If we think about the kingdoms of you know different groups of living things, we know about the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, we've got fungi, they are their own kingdom. So it makes sense if a mold is a fungi and mildew is fungi and those are bad, mushrooms are fungi. Eh, I can understand why some people aren't very sure um, if this is a good thing to have around or have in their yard. So Mushrooms, though, are not mold. So it's kind of like a hen is a chicken and a rooster is a chicken, but a hen is not a rooster. So it's kind of, um, that may not be the best example, but you get the idea. So um, a mushroom is not a mold. It's not mildew. It's, it's its own thing. So, but they are in the same family. So it can be understandable. Um, what these mean, though, is these are actually a good thing. So in terms of why we would want them, I just want to make sure. Okay, here we go. So on this screen, you can see a little bit more about, there's a tiny little bit here at the bottom, and then this bit here. This is the mycelium I was talking about. And so there are all kinds of um, different cool mushroom and fungi vocabulary words, but we'll, we'll talk more about those. This though, you can kind of see in this visual where people maybe would get nervous if they're not sure they don't know what that is or they they worry that that might not be okay to have around um but they are actually really good to have we it is good to have mushrooms in our yard it's good to have fungal life in our soil that's a sign of healthy soil oftentimes and so especially if um depending on the area if it's a woody or perennial type of an area of your yard, if you've got trees, shrubs, perennials growing there, any wood chip mulch, like I mentioned, those are places that um, that good fungal network in the soil is, is a good thing and a, an indicator of some healthy soil. So to understand about healthy soil or about what mushrooms would have to do with that or any, um, any of the relation or association between these things, um, to understand why it's good when we see mushrooms in our yards, we need to understand what their role is in the ecosystem. And they really are, they're part of our composting crew. They are the composters. So um, I mentioned the different kingdoms and that they are not in the plant kingdom. So that means they don't produce chlorophyll. They don't make their own food. So what do they eat? They need to eat something. Everybody needs some nutrition, needs some uh, vitamins and things to live. Well, they eat 
organic matter. They eat dead plants and, and other organic matter in the soil um, or to break it down to add to the soil, like a tree stump or those types of things. So anyone who has tried to, or you know, successfully or otherwise, anybody who's had a compost pile or a compost bin and has watched this magical process of putting leaves and yard waste and kitchen scraps and all these things in there and just watching the magic happen as it turns into this beautiful, rich humus that we add to our soil. We've kind of watched that magic happen, but it's the, the microorganisms are the magicians. They're the ones kind of, you know, making all that happen behind the scenes. Um, so we really need them. They, it is, um, it is kind of like magic, I think. So bacteria, fungi, and other organisms work together to break down all of that organic matter. Um, and we value soil that's rich in organic matter. But why? Why is that? So if we think about um, what they're actually doing when they're breaking down this organic matter, they're breaking it down into smaller pieces that then can be utilized by the plants around them. Um, and oh, I was just gonna say something else about that, especially the woody, woodier parts. So bacteria might be breaking down certain things and fungi is breaking down other things and they actually have the capability to break down those woodier, harder, tougher pieces, those lig lignans um, and the harder cell pieces, cellular pieces and cellulose that, um, that the woody plant material is made up of. So they are very beneficial for helping. They build that forest soil um, and even, even just in our yards, a little bit of forest that we have with the trees and our shrubs and you know, maybe you have a, a much bigger section, but even if you have just a small section, they're very beneficial. So then they feed our plants, they help to break down organic matter to make healthy soil and help feed our plants, but then it goes beyond that. And this one, I um, got a little note on here. I found this, this graphic on um, actually New Zealand Geographic on their website, but I really liked it for the illustration of, um, even though they're going a little bit beyond what I'm talking about, so you can kind of, you know, that litter degrading where you're seeing that, just kind of ignore that. That's not what I'm talking about, but it's in the slide and it was a, it was a great um, graphic that they had. So I, I wanted to borrow that. Definitely want to give them credit. But um, I love that this image shows what's happening beyond just the breaking down of the organic matter. Um, by doing that, we already know they're making these nutrients more available to our plants. So they're helping to feed them, help our plants to be healthy, but the mushroom underneath the soil, what's happening, and the mushroom itself is, a, is more like a fruit, and I'll, I'll talk about that more too, but um, underneath the soil, what's happening under there, there are what are called hyphae that go out. They're kind of like, you can picture them like roots, kind of like how they're shown in this picture. They spread out and they'll actually wrap around and hold onto the roots of the plants around them. So these are mycorrhizal fungi and they, they have a symbiotic relationship with the plants that they are around. So they'll reach out and grab onto those roots, the plant roots and kind of wrap around and, and hang on. And then they work together. So the plants, since they do have chlorophyll and make their own food, as part of that process of photosynthesis, they produce sugars and carbs. And some of those sugars and carbs then the fungi are able to access by hanging onto their roots and they get a little bit of that to feed themselves. And then in return, they send those hyphae out even farther through the soil system and they are able to reach water, nutrients, minerals, vitamins, things that are farther away that the plant roots couldn't even reach on their own. They can go farther and farther away and reach those things and then help bring that back and transfer it into the plant. So they're taking some of the carbs and sugars and they are in exchange offering water with vitamins and minerals. And so they work together to keep each other healthy. And one thing that I think is completely fascinating about this is that um, this whole network of mycelium in the soil is so vast. And there are, there are all kinds of, I don't have statistics, I didn't pull statistics, but I know there are statistics about how many, like there are miles worth of hyphae, even in a thimble's worth of healthy soil with a good, um, 
you know, don't quote me on those exact you know numbers, but that's um, there's some really good information out there if you're interested in these topics that I find fascinating. And as you can see in this graphic, the um, this is connecting two trees. So then you can get into, if you look up the phrase, the wood wide web instead of the world wide web, there's all kinds of good information about that too. You can really dive deeper into this stuff and it's, it's fascinating. But by, with the mycelium holding on to these different roots and spreading out farther and farther in the soil, they can actually extend the plant's root surface by something like 700 times. So think about just how far the roots of the plant would be reaching on its own. And then when they have this symbiotic relationship with the fungi, they're able to reach nutrients and water and moisture and minerals and all of those things from so much farther away. And then potentially also share between each other by having this network, these connections underneath the soil. So it's fascinating stuff. So it's another reason though, that it's good to have these. When we see that there are mushrooms popping up in our yard, it's a sign that there's a healthy soil food web going on. All of these things that we don't see that are happening under our feet that are so important and help make our plants healthy. Um, so they also, while they're doing all of that, they're also helping to improve the soil structure. Um, they're also helping with aeration and filtration and with water absorption and actually helping the plants um, to be more resilient in times of a drought because they're offering um, a farther reach and better water holding capacity, all these different things. So it all works together. It really is a web. It really is a complex system and all of these parts are important. So when we see that little mushroom that just pops up above the soil, that's just one little part that we're seeing that pops up, but there's so much more happening underneath and behind the scenes. That's really cool. So those are all things that are good, but another question we tend to get then is, all right, that's great. We know they're good for our plants. They're good for our soil. I should be happy to have the mushrooms in our, you know, popping up in my yard. I'm happy about that. That's fantastic. I understand now, but what about, um, a lot of times people are concerned and they say, well, but I've got little kids or I have toddlers, or I have a dog. I'm afraid that they might ingest something that could harm them. Um, so are there any times or any reasons that we don't want to have mushrooms popping up in our yard or any certain ones that we want you know, to not have? Um, and so clearly, yes, there are poisonous mushrooms um, and there are poisonous mushrooms to different levels, ranging anywhere from inedible, which you eat it and you might get an upset stomach and it's not a good idea, or you get a very upset stomach or get very ill, very sick, or you could die. <laughs> Some are very, very poisonous. So um, definitely don't want to ever consume anything that you don't know 100% is safe, a thousand percent. I mean, make sure you're a hundred percent and three other people are a hundred percent sure before you ever, you know, try something for the first time. Three other knowledgeable people have you know, signed off on it or someone that you really trust or who's, who knows. Um, always good to be safe, safety first. So there definitely are some poisonous mushrooms. The thing is, if you have something that pops up in your yard and you're unsure, you're kind of, um, you're not really sure, these two pictures that I have here, the one on the left, these are called jacks or jack-o'-lanterns. It's a very cool mushroom. You don't want to eat it but they're beautiful. And I took this picture, it was dusk and just, it looked so cool with the lighting. And there's some interesting things there too. You can look up bioluminescence and there's some, there's some more interesting stuff to delve into even just on that one type of mushroom that I find fascinating. Now the one on the right though, this little cluster of these maroon um, small little mushrooms, I have no idea what those are. Maybe they're perfectly safe, maybe they're not, maybe they're I don't think they're edible, I, but I, I don't know. This is one of the ones where I saw the pictures. Here I saw them, I snapped the pictures so I could ID it later and add to that repertoire, the learning of you know all these different species that I'm adding to my list. I don't know. So if something pops up in your yard and you're unsure, you don't know, and you, you're just nervous about it, if you want to remove those, okay. The thing to know is um, you know if you wanted to rake them up or, or get rid of them, that's fine. The thing is, they might pop up again. So just, just remember that, which that can be good when you're you know, hunting for mushrooms or foraging to know where they might pop up again. But if there's something that you don't want, um, and this 
there's no reason for, you know, to not have these. So I'm not by any means saying you shouldn't have these, or if you see them, get rid of them. I'm just saying that's one that I know you shouldn't eat. So if there was something that, you know, you're worried about like that and you wanted to get rid of it, that's fine. But the mushroom itself is the fruit. So it's the fruiting body, the fruiting part of the fungi. So um, if you picture an apple tree and you go and you pick the apples, the tree is still there. So in this case, you might not see all of the rest of it that's again behind the scenes and underneath and kind of you know working its magic out of sight. All we're seeing is the fruiting part of it. So those mushrooms are there, you can get rid of them, that's fine, but then they might pop up again. So just don't be surprised if that happens or you think, oh my gosh, I just got rid of them and then they're, they're all right back again, you know, the next time it rains. So um, just something to know, just something to note. And so then the opposite of this question, the next thing that people usually want to know is if some of them are not okay to eat, we all know, you know, in terms of their role in the ecosystem and what the mushrooms jobs are, of course, we talked about soil health and feeding our plants, but they also feed animals, including us. So um, wildlife will eat mushrooms. We like to eat mushrooms. It's an important food source. Not all of them though. We just have to be careful which ones. So which ones are okay to eat? Are there any common ones that pop up in the yard that we can eat? Yes. So there are quite a few that are common and some of them, um, even if they are edible, they're not as commonly eaten. So I just picked a few that are easy to recognize for beginners um, and that are pretty common, actually probably sounding like, you know, from where everyone was tuning in from so far today, these are probably common in most people's areas. So in most temperate climates, um, it's possible to find these. So um, a couple of these right off the bat, the one on the left, these are called chicken of the woods, also called sulfurs. I'll talk about them more in a minute. Um, and then the ones on the right, it's another bird name. These are pheasants, pheasant back. They're also called dryad saddle. Um, and so these are two that are pretty easily recognizable. They don't really have lookalikes. I mean, there are always things that could be similar or especially to, you know, a brand new person, you know, if you've never tried to ID them before, you might see a couple of things and there are similarities. I mean, they are all mushrooms, but these are a couple that are pretty safe. Um, they're not usually confused with anything that's poisonous or will kill you. Uh, and they're pretty easy to identify. And I'll, I'll go through some of the things to look for when we're trying to ID um, mushrooms. So safety first, as I mentioned, <laughs> there's, a, there's a saying that all mushrooms are edible, but some are only edible once. And so that's one to definitely, and I didn't make that up. I don't, I don't know who to credit on that one, but that's just a common phrase or common saying. And if you're getting into mushrooms, it's definitely important to keep that in mind. All mushrooms are edible. Some are only edible once. If you eat it once, you could not have a chance to eat another mushroom ever again if you eat the wrong one. So always definitely uh, make sure that you are 100% sure on the ID. And we'll get to that. Now, even if you're eating a mushroom that you have determined is safe and you've got it confirmed and you know your ID and um, and you're comfortable that this is okay and this is safe to eat, if you were to find one of these in the woods, that's fantastic. Even if it's something that you know is safe, if you've never tried it before, it's still a good idea to start with a small amount. Start with small quantities, see how you do with it, just to make sure that, you know, it doesn't upset your stomach or something because everybody can have sensitivities. I just wouldn't get super excited. I found a big 10 pound, you know, um, harvest of chicken of the woods and, you know, made up all this food and ate it and then didn't feel well, you know, we want to enjoy it. So just, it's, it's sometimes easy to get excited and like, you know, um, just dive right in and, and it can be a good idea to Take a little, you know, a little bit first, a little at a time, sample a little, see how you like it, see, you know, maybe try different ways of preparing it and, and kind of ease into it a little bit. And I'll talk a little bit more about these individually too, but um, this is another one of the easiest to identify mushrooms. And it's very common. This is a puff ball. Um, this picture on the left, I took at the farm, at McDonald Farm. It, it was actually, we were doing a program for kids and the kids found it. 
this was right before Halloween time. And <laughs> as you can tell by looking at it, I'm sure you can get some ideas of what you might think it looks like that the kids thought it looked like. They were certain they found a skull. You know, they were all like, whoa, cool. This is, you know, this is really cool. But it was a puffball mushroom. So um, very interesting. They can range in size anywhere. You know, you'll see them when they're small all the way up to, I have a picture with, um, I didn't put it in here, but a picture of my dad with one he found that was, I mean, like the size of a beach ball, it was huge. And um, typically you'll see them on the ground in maybe clusters, you'll see several of them together. They are edible. Um, on the right side here, this picture, you can see when they're chopped up, I was cubing that one and um, it looks like marshmallows on the inside. And that's what it should look like. It should look like a marshmallow. It also should not have an odor to it. There is one other type of mushroom that at a small young stage might look similar, but it has an odor to it. And the puffball really doesn't, it, it should not have an odor. So that's one way, you know, if it's larger, it's not that other thing because they don't get that big. But if when they're small and young, if you're unsure, is this a puffball or not, it really should not have an odor to it. So that's just one thing in IDing them. And they can go from small to large very quickly. All of these mushrooms, it seems like um, not as much the harder, drier, like a turkey tail or the um, like shelf mushrooms sometimes can get tough pretty quickly. But um, a lot of the softer mushrooms, they really seem to just, they grow so fast. Like they will just show up and um, you'll get this big flush of mushrooms that weren't even there the day before. Like they, they just happen so fast. So that can be something that actually, that can make it kind of hard to try to forage for mushrooms because you have to get the timing just right. Some of it, you might know the season, um, but sometimes you have to also, you know, it, to make it, first of all, to have a place to go foraging that's okay and where it's allowed and legal. Cause like around here, you can't just go pick mushrooms wherever you want. You can't go foraging in the forest preserves and things. Um, and so if you have them in your yard, that's fantastic. Then maybe you'll see it when it happens. But if you were to go, out for a walk, maybe at the back of your yard and maybe you have a little more wooded area, a little farther from the house and you don't, you're not in that space as often, you're busy with your work schedule and whatever, um, you might miss it entirely if you don't know to look for it or you might have something really great out there and by the time you notice it, a few, it's a few days old and it's already kind of fading or on its way out and not the freshest. So with this one in particular, here is a good comparison between what a puffball should look like on the inside and what it looks like when it's old and not so fresh. So the one on the right, that darker color, you would not want to eat. The one on the left is good. And so, like I said, those grow on the ground and um, they're pretty common. We seem to find them, like I said, that that one that the kids found was right before Halloween. So it's usually in the in the autumn is when we see those, um, when I see them most commonly. Now I have seen them, a lot of times you'll find older um, puffballs that are dark, faded, and there are different kinds. There'll be small ones on tree branches and they have a hole in the top. And when you see that, that hole in the top, those, it's because they were, that's how they release their spores. So once they get mature, um, so you might find the outer shell of it with a little hole in the top where it's already been, um, it's already done and it's released its spores to reproduce. So spores are kind of like the seeds of a mushroom, but they're these tiny, tiny, like microscopic, like dust um, for their seeds that help them to spread. And so that's actually another tip too. A lot of times um, if you were, if you had a couple mushrooms in the yard that you wanted to get rid of, you might want to, for whatever reason, you decide, you know, just to be safe, just the mushroom part, you're gonna pick those. You might want to put those in a bag that isn't porous or doesn't have holes in it so that when you're carrying it away, you're not dropping the spores all along and just leaving them there to make more. Um, however, if you're collecting mushrooms that you do want more of, it might be good to use a mesh bag or something with holes in it so that you can carry the mushrooms, but the spores will fall out and stay there on the ground and maybe make more mushrooms for you to have later. So this is the other one I mentioned on that, the first slide about the common edible ones. This one is called a pheasant's back or a dryad saddle. And you can see 
So especially on these right here, you can kind of see why it would be called a pheasant's back. And maybe if I had this zoomed in a little bit more, you'd be able to tell it almost kind of looks like a feathery pattern on the back of a bird. It's, it's very pretty. These are best when they are small and young. Um, this was on a dead elm tree and, um, but they can also grow on a couple other different types of soft woods. And I've got some, actually I have a list of some of those too that I can always share that later. Um, I typically though, a lot of the, most of these that I'm talking about aside from the puffballs that like to grow on, um, on the ground, the ones that I'm showing here that grow on wood, um, they typically like the oysters and the dryad saddles. Some of these, sorry, I'm kind of tripping over my words there, but basically a lot of them tend to like the same few trees the best, at least in our area. They might grow on other trees in other areas, um, but here, so we've got elm, ash, um, some things like to grow in softer woods like maple, some like a harder wood like oak, but that's kind of, you've got a handful of trees to look for. And then like when you're talking about um, morels, which we'll talk about more in a second, but if, when you talk about oak, then also apples. You always hear about apples or people finding them in old apple orchards. And so it can also be other um, plant families where things are related. If they like one, they might like something else in that same family or similar. If they like hardwoods, they might like other hardwoods. If they like softwoods, they like other softwoods. So that kind of gives you an idea of where to look for some of these things. Um, but so for these, they are best when they're young and small, they're tender like that. When they get bigger, like these on the right side that are larger and more like looking like giant pancakes, they start to get really tough and they're not as good to eat at that point. Um, another way to, to make sure that you have a dryad saddle or a pheasant back is the, the fragrance. It smells like a watermelon rind, which is unique. So check for that scent. And there's some other things too we'll talk about in terms of ID in a minute, but just I want to give you guys some kind of clues about these particular mushrooms and some of the things to look for with them in particular. So chicken of the woods, that was the other one I mentioned before, um, also called sulfur, also called chickens. So if you hear someone say, just says, you know, I found a whole bunch of chickens, this is probably what they're talking about, probably not actual birds and chickens, but um, they're called chicken of the woods because guess what? They taste like chicken. Um, and so they're very versatile. It's a really good, it's a prized mushroom because it's um, so easy to cook with and it has a good friendly flavor that's not, um, doesn't you know really deter people from eating it. It's something that a lot of people like the flavor of. So that's a really nice one to find. Um, it's, it doesn't really look like anything else. So when you look at this, it almost kind of looks like some of that um, foam, like the insulating foam that comes in the can and you spray it and it kind of trying to think of what we use that for, maybe like a pond sealant for our pond in our, in our garden. Um, but there is a, an expanding foam that that's what these kind of remind me of. And that color, that gorgeous orange and yellow color and just the shape of it, um, there aren't a lot of others that you'll mistake with this one. So that's, that's a really great find. Um, and then of course the prized morel. So I'm gonna move this box here for me. Okay, so morels, this one I didn't, I'm including it in the top five, but the first three are easier. These are, those are easier to ID. A morel, once you know a morel, they're very easy to ID. So I'm still gonna keep it in the top five. However, to a new mushroom hunter or you know, newly, if you find something in your yard and you're unsure, there are several varieties of morels that are edible, but there are also several varieties of false morels that you don't want to eat. So it's really important to know the difference, to know what you're looking for and to know, again, how to ID these properly. Um, so time of year, May is when they're usually popping up around here. There are actually um, there's a page I'm on, it's a morel watch where people start reporting when they're finding them. So you can kind of watch the map because they start farther south where it's warmer. And as the temperatures change and come, you know, start warming up in the spring, as they get closer up to our area, it'll tell me when it's almost time to go start looking. And um, so May, uh, a lot of times early to warm up, that's going to be on a south facing slope where it's getting the sun, it's warming up that time of year. 
And then again, the types of trees that you're um, going to look around. So these actually were found, this was right near Oaks and I'm trying to think what else is over there they were probably there mostly because of oaks because the other trees around it there were some maples and I'm trying to think what else was over there um hickories hackberries a few things like that black cherries so these were probably here for the oaks this was an accidental find and so um people get very excited when they get you know when they find their morels that's a big deal and a lot of people don't like to share the location and i i still I have to joke about it, but I kind of kick myself because I taught my dad to ID them and now he gets them all before I do. <laughs> so that wasn't, that wasn't the best idea. So people, you know, they like to keep those, um, those prized spots a little bit of a secret so they can get their morels before um, other people find them. So if you have them in your yard, like my parents do, and you're very, very lucky. Um, so that's fantastic. Otherwise, if you have a good, sp uh, good spot where you are able to go, or there's even like there are mushroom forays, like morel hunting, like weekends and big things that you can go and join to, to do this and try to find them, which is great, especially um, when you're learning. But it's good to know if you can kind of see in this picture. So you can tell the, the shape at the top. This is different from a false morel, but they have that really defining look to them. Um, and a false morel can be similar. There are differences, but I can see it, you know, it could be easy to confuse them. So one thing you'll want to do is check the cap. It doesn't hang off, it's not a separate piece. The cap is attached, it's all one piece. And the other thing too, if you think you found a morel that looks like this, cut it in half and the entire thing should be hollow from the tip to the base, the whole thing should be hollow. So there are things like that um, that you learn as you go along and you learn a couple of mushrooms at a time, you know, whichever one is in season or whichever one you're interested in learning about. And then you just keep learning as you go and, and add on. I had to put in this picture on the right here. This is my dog, Dixie. And like I was saying, people get you know really proud of their finds. I have to give her credit for this one because my first morel, I didn't actually even find, my dog found it for me. <laughs> so I don't know if you can see right here in the foreground in front of her. So she got to pose proudly with her first morel. So, you know, there are dogs that sniff out truffles. I'm hoping she'll do this again and help me sniff out some morels. She's a sweet girl. Okay, and then oysters. So this is another one. Um, this on the left, these blue oysters or a gray dove, there are several different varieties, all kinds of different varieties of oyster mushrooms. These can be very common to find in the woods, but you're more likely to find the ones on the right, more of a tan color, a beige, a creamy, or almost even a white. Um, the ones on the left, those are more typical of what you see when you grow your own, which is something else I'll, I'll go over quickly. But um, so because there are different varieties, um, there can be, there can be a little bit of confusion. So this is one, again, it's in the top five. Once you know how to ID an oyster, fantastic, then you can do that. But when you're not 100% sure, there can be things that can be a bit confusing about this. Now, they are typically in the spring or the fall around this area. Um, and so I found them at both. And they also are one that, uh, like a lot of them, you want to get them at the right time because when they get too old, um, they're just not as good anymore. Now, these don't get tough, but they, they can get insects in them and they can just start to dry up on the edges. And um, so timing is is everything with a lot of these once they're they're ready they're ready and you want to get them at that prime time um so some of the things that you should know when you're starting to learn to id different mushrooms are the different methods so there are a lot of things to take into consideration um first of all where did you find it we talked about like the puffballs grow on the ground and you know some grow on wood or on tree trunks this one, I showed you in the other picture, the pheasant back, the dryad saddle that was growing on the dead elm. This one was growing in the grass. So that can be pretty tricky. But what's actually going on here is there was a, a log. There was a piece of wood that was underneath all of that, um, all of that grass. So it was just on, in the soil surface there. So this actually was growing on wood. But at first appearance, it looked like it was growing in the grass. So you have to be careful. What is, what is the substrate? What is it actually growing on? 
Um, another thing you can do is a spore print, which is what's shown on the right. You basically take the cap of the mushroom if it has a cap, or you know, in this in this case, the underneath part where the spores are. You put it on white paper. There's some instructions of how to do that, how long to leave it there. And then the print it leaves behind can help in the identification. What color are the spores? What is the shape? And there are different identifying characteristics that can help you make IDs that way, which is really interesting. Um, so where did you find it? When did you find it? Like I mentioned with morels in our area, they're typically coming out around May. So, you know, other things like those puff balls were in the autumn. So when did you find it? That can help with the ID. Um, and then if it is growing on wood, what kind of wood? Some, some different things like different types of wood or different types of trees. Some like more of a hardwood, some like more of a softwood. So if it has a stem, is there a ring on the stem? What if it doesn't have a stem? If you look underneath, does it have gills like this on the left? Or does it have pores like this one? This is a polypore that pheasant back on the right. Does it have gills or does it have pores or, or something else entirely? There, um, you've got all these different possibilities. Uh, like I mentioned with the morel, also if you if you were to cut it open, is it hollow? Is it solid? Is the cap attached? Um, so all of these things um, are very important to know. And there are resources to help you. There are books. There are videos. There are forums. There is an app on the on my phone even that helps with ID forums. I find there are a lot of very knowledgeable people and you can get a pretty quick confirmation or let you know if you're going in the wrong direction if you post pictures, but you have to know what to post. You have to give them this information, this background information to help people help you confirm your ID. Um, so, it, you know, and especially if it's something that you think you might want to eat, you definitely, like I said, you wanna be safe. It's always better to be safe than sorry. And um, so there's another saying there that goes along with that. And that's that there are old mushroom hunters and there are bold mushroom hunters, but there are no old, bold mushroom hunters. So you don't want to take those chances because that might be your last chance. Um, so the next thing is the safest way if you are unsure of ID, if you want to make sure, first of all, that you're legally foraging, if you're not allowed to in public areas, public lands, maybe these aren't automatically growing in your yard. Um, maybe they are, but you're unsure of the ID. Sometimes also we want to check on the substrate. You might find a perfectly beautiful edible mushroom, but maybe it's growing on treated lumber or something. And you don't want to consume that because you don't want the chemicals um, from what it's been growing on. So if you want to know that it's safe, you want to be sure of your ID, you want to know 100% what you have um, and that you can eat it, growing your own is a great way to do that. And so there are several different ways you can buy. Like I mentioned, I started a long time ago with a little countertop kit that basically was like beginner. You soak it in water and then your mushrooms grow. You get one flush and that was it. It was just kind of a fun taste of that. Um, then there are kits that go beyond that where it's a little bit more, you get a little more information with it, maybe a few flushes of mushrooms. It's a little bigger. Maybe it needs a little like humidity tent or a little more care, but you get more out of it, kind of your next level in learning. Um, these pictures here, um, Jennifer Hammer, who works with us at the Conservation Foundation here, she, um, she is growing mushrooms at home using different substrates she's played around with, and substrate by that I mean the growing medium, what it's growing on. So some are growing on straw, coffee grounds, wood chips, um, oh, what else, shredded paper, all kinds of different things that you can actually grow mushrooms on. There are um, oysters that will grow on like toilet paper rolls, soggy toilet paper, like they just, you know, they'll grow on that. So all kinds of different things you can play with there and you can actually order the spawn and inoculate your own substrate. So she's growing these, um, like in this picture here on the left, look at these beautiful oysters that are coming right out of the holes in the bottom of this bucket that she's got. Um, she's got inoculated the, the growing medium inside of there. And so going back, these are different kinds of oysters. We've got some pinks, and I know she said, um, so she's had a lot of success. These are looking great. I know she said the pink ones you want to eat right away because they tend to get a very strong flavor. So you don't want to let those go to too long or get too big. But, um, and I've done mushroom logs, shiitakes and oysters on logs. And so there are classes you can take, workshops, all kinds of good resources for learning how to do this. And a lot of times the 
um, the places that you'll get the kits or get the, the spawn, they call it spawn, there's plug spawn, which was what we were using to inoculate these logs on the right. This was actually a class I taught um, through the Resiliency Institute, which is located at the Conservation Foundation's property. We were doing a class on inoculating mushroom logs. These were, let's see, this was last spring. So I think we were, I don't remember, I think we did oysters first and then, no, these were shiitakes maybe, I don't remember. Um, but there are classes and workshops and all kinds of things if anybody's interested. So you can order a kit or you can just order the spawn, the, the spores basically like Jennifer did to inoculate your own growing medium, or you can buy these plugs to do the wood logs. You drill a hole, tap the little plug in that is, it's got all of the um, mycelium is already kind of starting to grow. You tap it in, seal it with wax, soak it in water. There's more to it than that, but it's, it's not as hard as a lot of people think it is. People get kind of intimidated, but it's, it's once you learn how it's not hard and you get these beautiful mushrooms um, and sometimes, you know, several times a year too, and spring and fall, depending on the type you're growing. So it's a lot of fun. You can actually even order um, kits where you can inoculate the wood chips in your garden or in your pathways or your landscaping mulch. And you can grow uh, what's called a wine cap, which is a really pretty tasty edible mushroom, like a gourmet mushroom, which are fantastic. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that you can um, get started doing that. I've got another joke too. This came from one of my students and I, <laughs> who, um, Simona, if you're watching, I took your joke. Um, so she, <laughs> she said, how much room does a mushroom need to grow? As much room as, as it wants. <laughs> of course, I'm going to mess that up, but uh, I thought that was cute. So um, in terms of where to get these different things, like I said, that very beginner kit, you can just order those a lot of times online or get them, you know, even at the, like in local stores or garden centers, they'll have those little beginner kits. Then you can go to, um, even if you just search online, there are so many good sources and knowledgeable people who sell kits like this and are really happy to help and share information to help you be successful in growing your own. Um, so there are a lot of good sources. A couple that I can um, say that I have personally worked with locally and have had good luck with. Uh, one is up in Gurney, Myco Ethos. And um, they are, they're doing a great job. They actually sell mushrooms that they grow, mushrooms they've foraged, products made with mushrooms and kits to grow your own. And they, they will help teach and do workshops and things too, which is very cool. And then um, Field and Forest Products is in Wisconsin. That's another one that I have ordered from and had fantastic luck with and everything has grown beautifully. It always arrives beautifully and quickly and they're very good to work with and very informative. So those are just a couple in our local area, kind of around here, local and regional um, that I've worked with, but there are so many good ones. Um, and so that's another thing too, there are endless sources. Um, and for people who, if you haven't heard the name Paul Stamets, that's a, a very big name that my brother actually met him and I was super jealous to get his picture taken and I didn't get to go with that day. I was, I was at a conference, so I missed that, but that was fun. He's a mycologist who a lot of people are familiar with his name because he, um, he really talks a lot and teaches a lot and does talks and he has, um, sorry, he has uh, books and he, you know, he does a lot to really help educate people. And so there are a lot of resources there and videos and he's a good one to follow. And there are so many more, but that's just a, a big name. If you want um, more to delve into on this topic, that's a, a great resource there. So um, I wanted to finish a few minutes before just so that we could maybe see if I can answer any questions before we're out of time. And I think it's about five till, so I probably should have been done at least know, a few minutes ago, but I tried. I wanted to get in a lot of information for you guys, but hopefully now I can answer a couple of questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. That was awesome, Connie. Thank you so much. There was so much information there. Thank you. It was great. <laughs> um, we do have a couple of questions here and there's a couple that I, I, I'm not quite sure what, what they were asking, but um, Donna wants to know, how do we tell the difference between mushrooms and toadstools? Oh, that's a good question. So a toadstool is just another name for a mushroom or a type of mushroom and toadstools I tend to think of as like the parasol type of a, of a mushroom that, you know, I think of little fairies underneath it, you know, like under the toadstools or like a little toad underneath the toadstool. Um, but it's actually not a different thing. It's just another name or another type 
um, that people refer to as, um, I'm trying to think of an example, kind of like, um, I don't know, we have names for plant, but then like sometimes like my grandma would call it something different, have like a cute name for something. So it's just like that. It's just another, another name or another type. There's two names for exactly. the same thing. Yeah. Um, and you kind of addressed this one a little bit uh, when we were talking about puffballs. And I just want to throw in, I found the biggest puffball I've ever seen actually on oh, yeah, the farm. Cool. And it was back over by where the, the fireplace was. I mean, this thing was about the size of a soccer ball. <laughs> I, I thought it was a piece of trash over in the grass in an unmowed area. And so I went over to collect it and I'm like, holy cow. And I actually held my, I had my, my little Burt's Bees lip balm. I had in my pocket and I actually held that up next to it and took a picture just to illustrate how big this thing was. I mean, it was like the size of my head. It was humongous. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so Jennifer wants to know, can you ever get a bad edible? Yes. So there are times when um, kind of like I mentioned, even if it's a choice edible, but it's growing on a less than choice surface, like a, you know, maybe treated lumber or a contaminated area of the soil where maybe there had been something spilled or something, you know, not ideal that you don't want to eat that, those could make you sick. So you definitely want to see what it's growing on. Um, <clears throat> and other than that, it would pretty much mostly be a matter of age. So if something is too old, if it's past its prime, um, especially if it starts breaking down, if anything is slimy or anything, you don't usually eat that. They shouldn't be slimy. There are types that are slimy that are not edible, but an edible one, once it's started getting that way, you probably don't want to eat it. It might have some bacteria and it's, as it's starting to break down and that could maybe make you sick too. So yeah, it's got to be fresh and growing on a good, healthy, clean surface. Awesome. All right. Uh, Jennifer says, I missed the other resource besides field and forest. You said two. Oh yeah. The first one is called Mycoethos. So M-Y-C-O-E-T-H-O-S. That's the one that's in Gurney, Illinois. Perfect. Um, and since we have so many folks from Ontario, Corey told us that uh, in the Sudbury, Ontario area, there's the Ugly Barn Mushroom Farm that they sell kits and ships. So for all Fantastic. of you watching in Ontario, which thank you all for joining us. I, yeah. I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised at how many folks we have joining us from Ontario right now. Um, but there you go. Um, Ashley has given us another joke. Okay. Yes. You know, we got We got to tell some jokes. Uh, what rooms have no windows and no doors? Obviously a mushroom. So, Love it. Thank you. I'm going to have to add, add that to my next one. <laughs> as, as environmental educators working with kids, I, I yeah. know we all have a, a nice repository of kid-friendly <laughs> jokes. So right? it's, it's always good to add a new one. So um, let's see. Uh, oh, Barb wants to know, do we have bioluminescent fungi here? And if so, where would we find them? So the picture of the jack-o'-lantern that I showed there, look up jack-o'-lanterns if you want to learn more about that. That's one that's readily found in our area. I don't know where you are specifically, but like I said, most of the ones I talked about today are going to be found in all temperate areas. So, um, but that's one. And there, you know, I always see people debating and talking and, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it doesn't work. It's not true. It's not really, you know, but then I've seen other sources that say, yes, this is bioluminescent and this is, you know, it's super cool. Um, so that's one to look into. And actually, and you just reminded me of something else I was going to mention in learning to ID. I'm sorry, I don't know if you guys can hear that in the background. I've got one of those bird clocks. <laughs> um, Luna clock. It's two o'clock. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but another way, another thing to check for is color change, not just in, like in terms of a bioluminescence, but if you scratch a surface or sometimes break a piece, there are certain mushrooms that will turn, they'll change color. Some will turn blue. So that's another identifying factor to look for, depending on the type. If you're unsure, you know, if there's some that are similar, sometimes one might be a color changing one and one might not. So that that's another factor. Right. And, and I just a question from me, as I was looking at the pictures, um, the jack-o'-lantern and the chicken of the woods, they're both orange. Other than that, are they, because the jack-o'-lantern is not edible, correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, so the, the chicken of the woods, tends to have white, yellow, and orange, and it's really foamy looking and kind of puffy looking. Whereas the, the jack-o'-lanterns kind of look more like an oyster, but they're orange, orange, like pumpkin colored. Got it, so, okay. Yeah. Very cool. Well, 
thank you so much. We are we are at two o'clock as your clock announced to us. So uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this up here. And yes, this was recorded. It will be posted on YouTube. I usually get them up within a day. So go ahead and give us a follow on there. Check out the incredible repository of information, not just our webinars, but we got lots of little um, short nature videos on there too. Lots of great, great stuff that we've been amassing in our YouTube collection. So um, give us a follow on there. Again, if you have any questions on this, please feel free, drop us an email, get them to me. I can get them to Connie if I can't find the answer for you. So uh, thank you all so much for joining us for our very first webinar in 2021. And um, stay safe, stay healthy, and join us next week for what is your landscaping style. So thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.